I want to start by making a few challenges to what was said yesterday in the opening session by Joshua Gans, uh, beginning with the argument this particular man is supposed to be a Keynesian. I'm afraid uh, pigs might fly in my opinion if you call him a Keynesian. I might as well call the devil uh, one of God's angels. Uh, this is a Keynesian, Hyman Minsky. And I want to go through his arguments and why that made me be one of the minority of economists who saw the global financial crisis coming. The real puzzle is not why I saw it, but why the vast majority did not. And the answer is they don't follow the arguments of, uh, of Minsky, but they stick instead with the delusional ideas that come out of the neoclassical school of thought of whom Milton Friedman was a founding member. Now, one of the classics here is in a, a paper, I think the one he got the Nobel, Nobel Prize in Economics for, called The Optimum Quantity of Money. And he says in that particular statement, if you can see it from the back there, nothing is less important than a nominal amount of money. And then goes through an exercise saying if you multiply the amount of money in circulation by a factor of 100, that'll have no effect. But typical Milton Friedman. Uh, Joan Robinson, in a conference I once uh, organised at the University of Sydney, the undergraduate student, described Milton Friedman as a man who would put a rabbit in, into a hat in full view in front of, a, of an audience and then ex expect applause as a magician when he pulled it out shortly afterwards. <laughs> well, that particular trick here is saying that it doesn't matter uh, if you increase money by a factor of 100, so long as you multiply debts and everything else by exactly the same factor. Well, that's not the planet we live on. And the person who knows the planet we do live on is Hyman Minsky, and his arguments are much more about the real world of finance, talking about what he calls hedge, speculative and Ponzi finance, and the Ponzi financial units effectively are people speculating on rising asset prices, and he makes the profound point that they can only get away with that as long as asset prices continue to rise, and once that stops, there'll be a panic as people try to reduce their debt ratio. Now, they're not in the same camp. They're diametrically opposed thinkers. Calling one a Keynesian is, in my opinion, an insult to the other. So that is one side of my uh, comments on yesterday's speech by Joshua. Uh, he mentioned the asset bubble. He only showed you one of them. These are two of them. There are two asset bubbles, of course, going in the States, the stock market and the housing market. The red line is an index of the degree of overvaluation of the stock market called the 10-year price to earnings, lag price to earnings ratio. The blue line is the CPI deflated value of American housing. Now, they are both, as you can see, there are two bubbles at once, and that's the first time it's happened in America's history. It didn't, the one asset bubble wasn't big enough to absorb the cause because, of course, this isn't the global financial crisis. That is the symptom of the global financial crisis. That's like calling the spots on your face from a, a bout of the measles the disease. No, it's not. It's the symptom. This is the disease, the level of debt. And if you go back and take a look at the debt level of debt compared to GDP in America back at the Great Depression, you find that prior to the start of the Great Depression, that peak reached 175% of GDP and then accelerated above that level courtesy of falling prices and falling output. Debt was actually falling at the same time, but not as fast as both GDP and prices were falling. We are now in America at 300% of GDP. So the factors that caused the Great Depression are about one and a half times as strong this time around as they were back in the 1930s. Now, I keep on being told Australia is different. Uh, I call it the kangaroo theory of economics. Well, partly that is true. Skippy does have a slightly lower level of debt, but the pattern just looks just the same over time of a peak and then a crash in debt levels compared to GDP. Uh, the first of those peaks you can see was the, uh, was the peak caused by the Melbourne land bubble, which then burst and caused the depression of the 1890s. Then we had the depression of the 1930s, and people are telling me now we're not having a crisis. If there's any correlation between debt levels and our economic situation, we're still in one. Now, it's also been said quite regularly, I know this Glenn Stevens made this comment to a parliamentary committee long, long ago, that nobody predicted this course of events. You couldn't see which way it was, you couldn't see this was going to happen. Uh, I, this is a, a year after I started making this case. I started publishing a regular report called Debt Watch, and this is the conclusion of that Debt Watch statement. Uh, and I've interest, looking back and see, taking a look at it, I noticed I had some sort of inkling, maybe they're going to double the first-time buyer's grant again. Well, unfortunately, I got that one right. Uh, 
And if you do those sorts of policies, as I said, you'll just make things worse in the long term, the medium term. It might work for a short while, but restore the bubble, but you're going to be back in the same dilemma again. Now, I can go back further than that again. I've given some quotes there from an article by an academic in the Netherlands who tried to identify other economists who saw this coming prior to the crisis. He came up with about a dozen. Uh, apparently, he's up to about three dozen now who've got uh, legitimate claims that they called the crisis before it happened. It's not particularly good out of a profession with probably about 20,000 members. And uh, most of them were in the camp of saying it couldn't be predicted. I made a submission to the Wallace Committee on deregulation, financial deregulation in Australia back in 96. And at the hearing, they told me they were considering securitisation of loans. And I was so shocked by that that I wrote a supplementary letter the day after I made that case and made the comment that securitisation doesn't alter the, the key issue, which is the capacity of borrowers to commit themselves to debt on the basis of, of euphoric expectations during an asset boom. And then, of course, if that boom doesn't continue, then those borrowers will be uh, made bankrupt, but not only them, also the people who purchase those securitised loans, believing they're a source of income, will also potentially be sent bankrupt. Now, I'm not calling myself, claiming myself to be Nostradamus, I'm claiming to follow a sensible economic theory that sees the dangers in allowing things like securitisation of loans. Of course, that warning was ignored. They allowed securitisation here. It grew like topsy in America, and that's where the subprime crisis came from. If anybody with a Minsky pair of glasses on rather than a neoclassical pair of blinkers could see this coming a long time away. Now, speaking of blinkers, I think one of the best pairs is being worn by the OECD. In November of last... Sorry, June, June of 2007, this was their outlook for the global economy. The current situ situation is better than we've experienced in years. Our outlook is quite benign. A soft landing in the United States. God, I wouldn't like to see a hard landing. That wheel falling off the plane in uh, Melbourne would be nothing compared to a hard landing with this guy at the wheel. And on they go, expecting uh, the OEC to be characterised by uh, strong job creation and falling unemployment. That was November of 2000... Sorry, June of 2007. So why on earth are they so ignorant? Why do they miss it so completely? That's really the question, not why did I see it coming, but why do they completely miss it? And there are two basic reasons, quite comprehensive ones. Their modelling is equilibrium-based. They believe the system always heads back to equilibrium after a shock. I think you could get that feeling in Joshua Ganz's presentation yesterday. And they ignore the role of credit and debt, and that's also fairly clear. Part, part, part of the text is actually not turning up on the screen, I'm afraid to say. I'll need to read a couple of lines there to you. Now, the only theory that predicted this dynamic is Minsky's, but it's based on the solid foundations of a genuine interpretation of Keynes rather than a mythical one. And one of the key points Minsky made was that you have to, if you, if you don't, if you have, because the capitalist economies have regularly experienced depressions, particularly in the 19th century before we had large government, uh, if, then your economic theory has to be able to recreate depressions. If it doesn't, it's not a theory of the economy in which we live. Now, that rules out neoclassical economics completely. I don't think you can find a neoclassical model which can generate endogenously a financial crisis. You need to put up very weird conditions to get anything like that happening. Normally you need to presume a meteor strike from Mars or something like that. Now, Minsky's not quite so obscure. He has a model which is aware of both time and debt and says, consider the economy in historical time. Remember some time in the past when there was a debt-induced recession. And as a result of that recession, both lenders and borrowers are very conservative about the amount of debt they'll consider taking on. Because of that conservatism, only conservatively estimated projects are put forward, but because the economy is recovered, most of those projects succeed. And what does that mean? People think, oh, we were too conservative. If we'd been more highly geared, we would have made more money. So that the risk premium people have starts to drop. They want a higher level of debt to, 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 GD, to uh, income in future to get higher leverage gains. Uh, the debt-to-equity ratio they'll consider uh, taking on rises, and they start to revalue assets upwards. Now, that leads to what Minsky calls the euphoric economy. And it'd be an interesting exercise to go through the financial review over the 20- or 30-year period and see how often the word euphoric was used to describe expectations during things like the Poseidon bubble and all the other bubbles we've had, particularly the 19, uh, 1980s. And Minsky's argument is a period of tranquil growth in a capitalist economy will lead to rising expectations. So even if you can define an equilibrium for the economy, behaviour under uncertainty will cause that equilibrium to become unstable and the economy will go into another bubble. And the classic line, stability or tranquility in a world with a cyclical past and capitalist financial institutions is destabilising. 
So for a while that works. She gets self-fulfilling expectations, meaning a high level of investment, growing the economy more rapidly, validating a wide range of investments, including those involving debt. Rising asset prices, so any idiot can think they're a genius on the stock market when prices are going up. And an increased willingness to lend, which actually drives up the money supply. I'm going to come back to that later, but the money supply is not controlled by the government. The reserve banks around the world admitted that 20 years ago. Economic textbooks still teach the opposite, but certainly the the money supply will expand under the demands of the financial sector to provide the money it wants for speculation and investment. 